Let's open to hymn number eight, eight. Him number eight, eight. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, not knowing it was for me he died on Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I spawned. That is the law that I did not regard. Till my guilty soul, imploring, turned, begging, repenting, and returned to Calvary. Now I have given Jesus to him everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing about Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to mankind. Oh, the mighty gap that God joined together. The mighty separation that God bridged. At Calvary. Mercy was great. And that grace was free. Pardon was multiplied there for me. At that place, my heavy soul got liberty. At Calvary. I say again, sink the spirit of the song, not the melody or the letter. Sing and have understanding. Yes, I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. No, we not it was for me, he died. On Calvary, go. Yes, I spent in vanity and pride. Caring not my Lord was crucified. No, when not it was for me, he died. On Calvary. Read to by God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I despond till my guilty soul imploring turned to God. Three. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my rapture so can only sing of Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty God that God 
this pan on Calvary. Mercy, there was great and grace was free. Ah, then there was multiplied to me. There, my bed in so foundly, but he had Calvary. Hymn number one. One. One zero one. How I pray that the spirit behind the words that we are reading will open our eyes that we might understand the purpose of Calvary. The greatest evil that has befallen the Christian faith is an exchange that has taken place. The emphasis is not he who died. The emphasis is not the accomplished work. The emphasis for many people is what I receive, what I get now in this life. The emphasis is not about heaven that sin will cost man. And Jesus looking at This irreparable loss, something that cannot be recovered, something that once it is lost, it is forever lost. And Jesus, seeing this great trouble that before sinners, he came and was crucified as a sinner, and yet he committed no sin. The greatest evil is that the people called Christians don't appreciate, nor do they understand what happened for them at Calvary. And that's why people come into Christianity. They either be chasing shadows and the mundane things of this world. Or they come into church instead of seeking and serving and knowing God. They are playing politics. They are playing games. What an unfortunate thing. In hymn number 101 Once I was bound by sins bitter chains chained like a slave i struggled in vain but i received the glorious freedom when jesus broke my fetters into two freedom from all carnal affections every one of us who is born again knew when you were under captivity of one immoral or carnal habit that you couldn't get yourself out from until the day you gave your life to Christ and a new life began. Free from vain and worldly ambitions, it is still holding people captive and even people that come to church, many of them are still in captivity, claiming to be free and yet they are servants and people in bondage unto sin. Freedom from envy, hatred and strife. Freedom from all that saddened my life. Christianity should make everyone. You wake up in the morning because you have now no condemnation. Now no condemnation. The scripture said you will be a happy person after you have prayed unto God. You have no condemnation. Your sins you have confessed and your sins you have forgiven you. You have access unto the Father. You have access unto the throne of grace with boldness because your sins have been washed away. But Unfortunately, people are Christians and they are carrying heaviness, condemnation of their consciences because they have not been set free. They are still in the bond of iniquity. But freedom was given at Calvary. Freedom from pride and all sinful follies. Freedom from love and the glitter of gold. Freedom from all evil temper and anger. Freedom from glorious freedom, rapture untold. Freedom from fear with all his torment. You 
No. If you have no condemnation, if anybody knocks at your door, you will simply say, who is that? You don't care whether it's the police, whether it's the guarda de finance, or anybody. You say, who is that? And if you don't like to open your door, you say, I'm sorry, I've gone to bed. Come and see me tomorrow. But if there are matters to settle, out of panic, you jump out of bed. You either run away or you open the door and face the music. It says, freedom from fear with all the torments of fear. If somebody has committed immorality, a Christian has gone into women or gone into men or gone into dubious things, when we come to church to pray, he will be in trouble. He cannot have peace. He cannot have rest. If he prays prayers, he will never believe himself or herself. Freedom from fear with all his torments. Freedom from care with all his pains. He's not worried if he sought for anything and didn't get it. He will console himself with the knowledge that one of these days we will leave this world and we will go to heaven and we will never remember sorrows forever and ever. Freedom from care and worries of this life and all the pains. Freedom in Christ my blessed Redeemer. He who has rent my fetters in twain. Freedom from all the worry and anxieties that come because parents are saying, what are you doing? You are not married. What are you doing? What are you wasting time? Others are making it. Why have you been looking up to? Why, why have you been, you been carrying the Bible up and down? But when you know what holds in eternity, those worries will not put you in sorrow. Once I was bound by sins, galling fetters, chained like a slave, I struggled in vain. But I received a glorious freedom when Jesus broke my fetters in twain. Go. Once I was bound by sin's galling fetters, chained like a slave, I struggled in vain. But I received a glorious freedom when Jesus broke my faith as into a two freedom from all the carnal affections, freedom from a hatred and strife, freedom from vain and worldly ambitions, freedom from all that sadden my life. Three, freedom from pride and all sinful follies, freedom from love and guilt of gold, freedom from evil temper and anger, glorious freedom, rapture unto all, freedom from fear with all of his torments, freedom from care with all of his pain. Freedom in Christ, my blessed ready, my he who has reigned my faith has into a glorious freedom, wonderful freedom, no more in chains of Sin I repine. Jesus, the glorious emancipator, 
Now I'm far away. He shall be my. I want you to tell the Lord to bring you with the illumination of the word of God into glorious freedom. The freedom where you have no more condemnation. The freedom where you are no more burdened with worry and anxiety. The liberty of true children of God. Those that have been set free. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we have come for another time of exposition of your word. The bedrock upon which this ministry is built. Father, presently not many people are following to be established upon this rock that day Jesus Lord and Savior asked them who do they say that the son of man is and they said Elijah some say one thing some said another or Simon Peter said thou art Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus shouted and said, Simon, son of Jonah, blessed art thou, because flesh and blood, natural intelligence, ordinary knowledge did not teach you this, but my father I revealed this unto you. Therefore I say unto you, Peter, on the basis of this confession that I am Christ, the son of the living God, I will build my church and the gate of hell cannot prevail against it. Lord, that is the truth that Jesus is the son of God. That Jesus is the savior of the world. That is the foundational truth. Whosoever does not believe it will perish forever and ever. And so Lord, this evening, because our faith in Christ is what ends us salvation. Is what makes us acceptable unto the Father. I pray, Lord, that our eyes be opened and that understanding will be enriched that we might be able to understand the work of Calvary and the person of Christ in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for answer to prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. And amen. Shall we be seated? Men and brethren, I welcome you again to a special time. When I look back to the days when I started my Christian journey, if I don't hold my heart, 
I will be discouraged with what I see in the present day. In those days, we don't choose the fellowship we attend. In those days, it was very clear to us, as it is clear to me till death, that once a man closes his eyes here, he will open it in eternity, and it is either eternity with God or eternity with Satan. And most people are living as though this is not true. Most people are living as if it is a story, a fairy tale. But like it happened to those that were before us, there were people that had opportunity, they had directly from Jesus, but they didn't make anything out of it. Even in most recent past, there were Christians that tested the good word of God. They tested the power of the world to come. They were partakers of the heavenly gifts. Yet, they exchanged it for the mundane things of this life. For things that had no value. Today we see a lot of people in the world who bear the nomenclature born again Christians. And some of them will tell you, well, I love to come to fellowship, but my husband does not want me to come anymore. So I don't want trouble. Therefore, I stay at home. Or I want to come to fellowship, but you see, each time I come back from fellowship, my wife makes a lot of trouble. So I decided to stay back home for now until the matter is resolved. And what Jesus said about such people, the modern day preachers, the modern day Pentecostal preachers will convince and encourage them to tell them that you have no problem. You are just being wise. But Jesus Christ said that if you love mother or father or husband or wife or land or anything more than myself, you are not worthy of me. If you prefer me or prefer mother or father or your business or your very life, meaning your interest, meaning the thing that fascinates you, if you prefer them above me, you are not worthy of me. But today we have adulterated gospel where they tell the people we are not living in the olden days. Look at one thing. The principle of righteousness, the principle of salvation can never change as God himself does not change. The only thing that may change is a method of bringing that message to the people. A method of explaining it. Maybe there is a new language like today. We have been using Bible. And in those days, when the Bible was a handwritten book, it was voluminous. And so, people managed to carry them around and keep them in a safe place and write some particular books and carry them around. Today, there's another method. You have electronic gadget that can carry all your Bible book. You just press a button and it shows you your Bible. If you want to read from Genesis to Revelation, you see it there. But the principle of right living, the principle of, being, of, of salvation, the salvation package has never changed, will never change. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh remains flesh. Anybody that is born of the parents, although they brought him to church, although they baptized him in water, but so long as he has not been born of the Spirit of God to come to the point where he repents of his sins and gives his life to Christ and they renounce the old life, what the Bible calls the hidden things of dishonesty, all the things that are in our hearts and in our lives that we would not like people to see, throw them away and then embrace Christ and with repentance and rejection of the old life, then pardon will be received. 
salvation will be received. The grace of God that brings salvation unto all men will be released unto the individual. But the people of this age have changed it and they said, if you just believe, if you just believe, just simply believe. But it is not as simple as that. Believing has a lot of implications. One, believing that Jesus came to destroy sin. Satan, he didn't come, like I told us last time, he didn't come to manage sin or manage Satan. He came to destroy sin and Satan. And if you claim to be a Christian and sin has not been destroyed in your life and Satan has still been having upper hand in your life, you are not a Christian. Your church may tell you that you are a Christian. But you know what we tell you who you are. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the dead in Christ will rise first. And we that are alive and remain in the faith will be caught up by divine magnet into heaven. No jokes about it. No favoritism about it. Nothing like partiality about it. Nothing to, to speak except that the blood of Jesus in your lifetime have washed you whiter than snow and you have maintained a conscience a conscience a conscience void of offense towards God and towards man a conscience where there is no condemnation nothing condemns the actions you took the things you did the conscience that is pure that what you said in the private is what you, you are called and you say it in the public not when you are saying another thing in the private and in the public, you say another thing. You become a dubious, two-faced individual. You are not a Christian. But I bless the name of the Lord for another evening like this so that we can go back to the world. But before we commence in the teaching, I want to show you something that could make you to think in Second Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. I read from verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria. Of course, you have heard about Syria. Syria is this nation where the man what do they call him Assad is ruling and the country is destroyed including Damascus where Paul encountered Jesus Christ 2000 years ago Damascus was a city 2000 years ago was a city great city has an entrance gate it was at the entrance of the gate that Paul was coming to enter there and arrest Christians. And arrest Christians. And then Jesus appeared mid-air and he fell on the ground. Now, here in 2 Kings 5, now Naaman, captain of the host of the, of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and an honorable because by him, by this Naaman, the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was a warrior. He was a fighter and a captain. He was also a mighty man in valor. But he had leprosy. Verse 2. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, a small girl. And she waited on Naaman's wife. They went into Israel and took men captive, including a small girl, a little girl. And what that girl does in the house is to wait. That is, wait to run errand for the wife of this captain. You girl, come, fetch me water. You girl, come, bring me this. So the girl was there waiting on Naaman's wife. Verse 3. And she said unto her mistress, Naaman's wife, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophets that is in Samaria? 
for he will recover him of his leprosy. Little girl. He said, I wish that the way God is with the people that are in Samaria, the people of God, the Israelites that live there, that God is like that to the people of this land. If it was so, if we are so, then this leprosy of my master, your husband, would have been a thing of the past. And the message rang. Verse 4. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Those and those said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of, is of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. Now, I'm not going further. I only want to bring out a point that should make you think. There are people here, if I ask them now, it will be embarrassment. If I ask them, can you quote me one scripture where the Bible talks about salvation? Where the Bible mentioned by whom salvation is gotten? It will be embarrassment. Let me leave it for today. But I, but I, I, we, I wish I just point at some brothers and sisters and ask them, tell me one scripture where you know that the scripture mentioned the source of our salvation or even what somebody have to do in order to be saved. If you don't know those basic truths, how then can you be saved? How then can you be saved? Do you think anybody can be saved by, by imagination or by empty mind? You are saved by the knowledge of God that you have. Jesus said to the people in the book of John chapter 15 verse 3. He said, you are now clean by the word that I spoke unto you. The word that I spoke unto you, you received it. It cleanses you from ignorance. It cleanses you from doubt and from every cloud that has beclouded you. So, this young girl, small girl, knew the God of her fathers. The point I'm making is, this small girl knew the God of her fathers and was confident unshakably, saying to the wife of Naaman, the, 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 the major general of Syria, the commander-in-chief of all the armed forces of Syria, his wife was whom this girl, little girl, Little girl, possibly older than Ikenna's son. Possibly the same age with uh, Israel. And she knew the God of our fathers and said, Would God, I wish that this God of my forefathers, that the people in this place know about him, this leprosy of the commander in chief will not be there again. And the message flew. And they say, eh? Which God? He said, God of Samaria. The God of the people of Samaria. The God of Israel. And the message ran to the king. And the king wrote a letter to the king of Samaria. I am sending you my captain. He's a leper. I heard that God is in your place. The maid here told us, please heal him. And that was how Naaman was healed. By whom? By the knowledge of a small girl. And we have parents today. They themselves know nothing of what they say they believe. And talk less of the children they are raising. If you go to some fellowships, the testimonies are how God Bless them. They got job. What is wrong with it? Well, these are simple addendum, attachment. How God made them, made it possible. They got their chitadnanza. They got their this. They got their that. That's what they go to flaunt. That's what they go to magnify. But who told you that that is a testimony? It's not testimony. There is a testimony. A testimony that Jesus died and that you are now one of those that benefited from the death of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Let's return back to our studies. Let's 
last three weeks, we talked about salvation through faith in Christ. Salvation through faith in Christ. Salvation cannot come from any other place, from any other source, except from Christ. Men and brethren, in the Old Testament, the priests were ever busy killing animals, butchering them, bringing out what should be burnt up and what should be sodden and what should be buried. They were busy ever doing that. They had no rest. And if it is the day of great feasts, this is how people will be coming to make sacrifice of cleansing from their sins and pollution. So the priests will be busy killing and, and, uh, and uh, butchering the animals and then taking the parts that will be burnt, the parts that the, the sacrificer will take back and the one that is for the priest. And I was imagining how that place will be smelling. All that was to obtain temporal cleansing. Fleshly cleansing. The cleansing that does not reach the conscience. The Bible said that all the sacrifices of the people of old, the priests, Aaron and all his family, the Levites, their sacrifices never cleared any conscience. But a satisfaction that what God demanded is being done. Whether God accepted it or not, they don't bother so much because they wouldn't know. And of course, whether they knew or not, none of those sacrifices was able to atone for sin, but was a thing used to cover sin from the view of God until the blood that will wash it away will be shed to 4,000 years to come. And eventually, he came in Christ. And it has come and gone about 2,000 years ago. And we are living now to draw from the benefit of that sacrifice of the cross. But what a painful thing that people have come to church for five years, for eight years, and they cannot explain how their salvation was gotten. How this salvation can be gotten and be kept. And the only thing they know is pray for me. Pray for me. I got a job. I got married. I had children. The goods I sent to Africa, it has gone there and I, they sold and brought my money. But the message was centered on salvation through faith in Christ. We saw that in Romans chapter 3 from verse 21. To 31. We are not reading because of time. And uh, we saw the revelation of God's righteousness as subsection 1. The revelation of God's righteousness. The righteousness that God imputes. That is, carries it like a cloth. And covers someone that had repented. Who had believed in what was done at Calvary. God carries righteousness and covers that person. Not because the person had righteousness in himself. But now, God puts on him righteousness. That's the righteousness of God. Not because the person has labored for it, merited it, and we saw in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, from verse 8 to 9, he says, not of your works, lest any man should boast. It is just the gift of God. By grace are you saved, and that through faith. By grace, by free will, and free gift of God, you receive salvation. And how do you get it? You get it by faith. You get it by believing it. Praise the Lord. And then we moved on. Last Thursday, we saw the object of our faith. And through the studies, we saw that Jesus is the object of our faith. The person we look to. The person we hope on. In order that we might get our salvation. And we saw in one of the three strategic statements there. That Christ is the savior of sinners. That Christ is the only savior. 
and that God has ordained him for our salvation. That was what we learned last Thursday. So that you cannot hope for salvation from any other. In the book of Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, let's look at it again. Acts chapter 4. I read from us, okay, to help us a little bit. In chapter 3, before we read what is in 4. The man at the beautiful gate, verse 3, Acts 3, 3. Who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple? Ask them an arms. Ask them for help. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, with John and said unto him, Look on us. And he gave heed. He responded and looked on, on them, expecting to receive money from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I known. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Which means he had no silver and gold, but he had salvation of Christ. He had the faith of Christ and in Christ. And so he said, what I have, I give it to you. In the name of Jesus, rise and walk. Brethren, we have not come for academic exercise. As I'm talking to you now, if you take what I have just said and you face matters in your life, you face matters around you with the name of Jesus. I remember very well, some years ago, I was struggling. Sometimes I find myself that I cannot pray. I find myself that I am confused. And then I began to experience dryness. Loss of interest in prayer and in fellowshipping with God, singing unto God, everything became dry. Something will be saying inside me, rise and pray, but I will find it difficult. I'll be very reluctant. And suddenly, something began to work and help me. I said, begin to plead the blood of Jesus upon yourself. Plead the blood of Jesus upon yourself. Believe it literally. That as you plead, it is passing through your brain, entering your heart, entering your mind, entering your soul, entering the recesses of your being. That when it does, the contrary influences that have brought coldness, that have brought lack of interest, that have quenched your fire, your fire to pray, your fire to believe, your fire to sing, your fire to be attuned with God. I saw that as I pleaded the blood, I began to have get a release. My mind was released. My soul was released. And I could sing and I could pray. Now, because there is faith in Jesus. Now, when he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk, the man got up. Strength entered that his lame legs. And he began to walk and leap and jump and shout. And follow them into the temple. And the whole place was rent into two. Men were shouting. Because they saw God in action. They saw power in the name of Jesus. Make somebody free. And then in verse 12 of verse of chapter 3. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? Verse 13. 
the God of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But he denied the Holy One and the just and desired that a murderer be granted unto you. Look at chapter 4 verse 12. He said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name other under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved other than that name the name of jesus christ in verse 10 he says be it known unto you all and to all the people of israel that by the name of jesus christ of nazareth whom you crucified whom god raised from the dead even by him does this man stand before here before you whole this is that stone which was set at naught by builders you are, you builders but now that stone is become the head of the corner. Therefore, neither is salvation in any other name. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved other than that name of Jesus Christ. So, that was what we saw last week. And uh, we concluded by saying that faith in Jesus Christ involves three things and they are one continuously believing and trusting with the heart in the crucified and risen Christ and taking him as our personal Lord and Savior Paul said in the book of Romans 1 17 he said I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe, to the Jew first and to the Gentiles. He says it's not ashamed. But today there are people that are ashamed. There are people, right as we are sitting in all the fellowships that are connected, there are people that are ashamed. If they come before white people, they will not be bold to say, I am a believer in Christ. If they come before people that have money, that they are asking to help them, looking unto them to help them. They will not be able to confess that they are Christians. Especially when the man began to, begins to castigate Christians and mock Christians, he will hide his identity because he wants money. This is an indirect way of selling your Savior. This is an indirect way of denying your Savior because you want money, because you want gain. You hide your identity. No, if you are a true believer who wants to have God honor him and honor her for standing firm in what he believes, the man to help you or not, you will confess who you are, you will confess what you believe. If he doesn't want to help you, that is when God will show you that he is the owner of the universe. Most people have denied the Lord and they have hindered him from outflowing his power and his benevolence unto his people that love him, that, that, that he has promised to do unto them. But our attitude had kept God's hands to be tied. Do you know, the Bible says, woe unto him that put his trust in man. Woe unto that person who puts trust in man. Yeah. A man had promised to do something for you or you have taken that person up as God. That if this person doesn't help you, God will not help you. And then that person be becomes your God. And God says to such people, woe unto them. Cost are there. So brethren, you know why it is so painful that these things happen? It makes people's prayers to be unanswered. God is a jealous God. God is so big. He asked, is anything too hard for me to do? God is asking, I am God. I am not a man. But 
if you begin to trust men, if you begin to hide who you are in in Christ and in God, in order that men will help you, God will equally spew you out of his mouth. You may not be here last Tuesday, but if you were here, we read, was it last Tuesday? Okay, I think maybe Sunday. We read in the scriptures how God showed that if you don't believe in him strongly, if you don't confess him strongly, he said, I will spew you out of my mouth. He said, if you are neither hot or cold, that means you are lukewarm. If unbelievers are talking, you identify with them. You wouldn't want them to know that you are a Christian. Now, when Christians come out, you stand again as a Christian, which means you are not fixed. You are floating. Whichever side that situation warrants you should identify with, you do. God said, for all such people, I will spew them out of my mouth. For they are neither hot, hot or cold. They don't either believe in me or completely give themselves over to the devil. And you know why? God will not take 99.99%. He wants you are all. Satan is ready to take 1%. Satan is ready to take 1% because he knows that that 1% will make God not to accept the 99.9. So brothers and sisters, our faith, our confidence in God, in Christ must be unshakable. The scripture is very plain that our object of faith, assurance of salvation is Christ. And then verse, where we said number two, the, one, the first one, continuously believing, trusting in the crucified and risen Lord. Number two, turning away from sin with true sorrow, with true repentance, and turn to God through Christ. And number three, obedience to Jesus Christ and his word as the only way of life. Not partial obedience. Not pretended obedience. But complete and implicit obedience unto his word. That is what guarantees that one is trusting and one's salvation is in Christ. And that Christ is the object of one's faith. And lastly, the efficacious redemption. That is the, the redemption that is effective. That, that gets what is expected to get. That gets the result that is expected of it. Efficacious redemption. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans 3. I read from verse 25 to 26. It says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of the sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, one, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. That Jesus will be the just one and the one that justifies whosoever man or woman that believeth in him. So, the redemption we have in Christ is through his blood. The redemption that we got in Christ or we have in Christ is through the blood of Christ. I will show you a little bit of the Old Testament, how redemption or redemption was typified. That is, was pictured, but it's not a real one. But it was 
given, shown as a model. For instance, uh, some time ago, we showed us the design of the fellowship center we want to erect in the property we are planning to buy. Or they call it a prototype. Small thing designed. They showed car parks. They do toy cars and place them there showing how cars will be in the place and build a house in a small way and show the features. When you look at that house, then you can in your mind blow it up the way it will be and the way it will look like in the site as the main building. Now, well, that is a prototype. Now, salvation plan of God for us through Christ's blood was shown in the Old Testament in a prototype of animals being killed and the blood of those animals sprinkled on the people on the day of atonement. This story, if we have not repeated it in this church, it is more than 130 times repeated these stories. And the more we repeat it, I myself or one, as well as other pastors and leaders, when I repeat this story, I bring myself into more commitment unto Christ for what he did for me. That the prototype of salvation package that was done of old was once in a year. The high priest will take the blood of animals. They will bring so many animals, clean animals. Animals without blemish. Kill them and pour their blood in a basin. And the priest will take something like broom. And the Levites will carry that blood. And the priest will carry it and be sprinkling it on the people on the day of atonement. You know what it means? That when the blood of these animals will be sprinkled, that God will now look on the blood and not look at the sinner. Please take the sinner to be this microphone that is very black. And then the blood of animals now superimpose it upon it. As the priest sprinkles it. Now, ceremonially, I, I told you as a prototype, as a picture of what will really happen that has not happened. But in the interim, for now, God now uses the blood of animals and look on the blood of animals and take the blood of animals to be the blood of the sinners that must die for their sins. And so, after that atonement, it is assumed, it is taken that they are now ceremonially clean. But ceremonially, please watch the word. Mark the word. Ceremonially clean. Not that they are spiritually clean because their conscience of sin has not been purged. Murderers among them remain murderers. Fornicators among them remain fornicators. And everybody was waiting for that Messiah who will come and set all men free from their sins. This one that was done was just in the interim as a temporary measure. That was what the Old Testament shedding of blood amounted to. But brothers and sisters, can't you see that this blood matter is a serious issue? That from the ancient times, from the very beginning, the moment Adam sinned, the moment Adam sinned and lost the glory of God, God himself went to the garden, asked them, where are you? And they were hiding. I asked them, have you eaten the fruit I told you not to? They began to accuse and excuse themselves. Finally, when they ate that thing, what happened? They saw that they were naked. The glory of God departed. Men and brethren, we were made originally to be the children of God and having the resemblance of God, having the glory of God. And then when man sinned, that glory was lost. And immediately that glory was lost, man discovered that they were naked. They had no covering again. The glory of God that covered them and nobody could see them. They were hidden in a cloud of his glory. That thing was evaporated. That thing was taken away. And they saw themselves that they were naked. And they went to cut, take 
leaves and front, and front to cover their nakedness. And when God appeared in the garden and saw that situation, he went and killed some animals, some sheep or goat, and skinned them himself and came and clothed them with the skin of animals because man supposed not to be naked. But before that nakedness was covered, an animal's blood was shed. I am only bringing you to the knowledge of the importance of blood. When Israelites were to be delivered from the land of Egypt, remember, they were slaves. They had no spokesman for them. Nobody speaks for them. They are slaves. They have no voice. But God decided to take them out of the land of Egypt. What did he do? After the whole plagues that came upon them, the plague of locusts, the plague of darkness, the plague of lies, the plague of frog, the plague of many, many things. What did God use finally? On the night that God dealt the biggest blow on Egypt to release Israel to go. He told them to kill a lamb without blemish. A lamb without blemish. And smear the blood at the lintel of their doors. That that night, the angel of death will pass over the land of Egypt. Any family, any house, that that blood was not smeared at the lintel of their door, that that house will receive judgment. And what judgment? Their firstborn will die. Whether of animals, whether of the, of the peasant, whether of the rulers and of the king. The firstborn died that night. And that was the night that God enacted the Passover. The passing over of Egypt, of the angel of death, the angel of judgment. But what saved the Israelites were the blood of the lamb, spotless lamb that they smeared at the lintel of their door. And that lamb was now a prototype of the main lamb that will be killed in 4,000 years to come. From the period they were yet coming out of Egypt. 4,000 years to come, that lamb was typified by a prototype of animal lamb that could be taken and killed and eaten. And he told them, do you know how you are going to kill it? He said, cut it open in the center. Spread it hands apart legs apart. Roast it on the fire. Don't boil it. Now, if you follow what I'm explaining, which is the scripture, because I want to save time. If you follow this description, you will know that this thing that was done to the lamb in Egypt was the type of suffering that Jesus Christ received. A man was taken onto the cross, hands spread apart, nailed to the wood, and then left to hang the weight of a full man of about six feet something hanging on the nail that was on his palm. The whole weight of his body being carried by two points of nail, this hand and the other hand. That is like roasting. Does anybody understand? I said, does anyone understand? Because it's coming on me now. It's coming on me to affect my being. I was asking some people a few nights back, since you became a Christian, have you ever knelt down and you are talking to God and you are so touched with the love of God and the sacrifice that you found yourself broke down and cry? So, that was that blood that was sacrificed. So, in that time in Egypt, he said, take that lamb without blemish. The number of people that we do it. And he said, you eat it with a bitter herb. You eat it with a bitter leaf. Showing you the suffering, the torture that this real lamb we enter into. It was demonstrated on this animal lamb. And now look at what John said in John chapter 1. 
By then, Jesus was still alive. For nothing has happened to him. In John chapter 1, verse. Nineteen, and this is the record, John. This is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, "Who art thou?" And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, "I am not the Christ." Listen, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, "What then? Art thou Elias?" And he said, "I am not." Art thou that prophet? And he answered, "No." They were asking John this question. They said they unto him, Who art thou then, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, telling the people to prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah has said. And they which we are sent, we are of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then? Why are you baptizing? If thou be not the Christ, nor Elias, nor the prophet. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you, whom you knew not, or you know not. He it is who coming after me coming after me. That means I, John the Baptist, was born before him, but he is coming after me, not because I have any preeminence over him, but I am just coming as a messenger, as a forerunner. He says, but he it is who coming after me, yet is preferred before me. Whose shoes lashet or lace or rope I am not worthy to unloose. Verse 28. These things were done in Betabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Verse 29. The, the next day, after John answered this question to the Pharisees and those that came to inquire and ask him who he was, and they left. The following day, John see it, Jesus coming. Then as John looked and saw Jesus coming. Look at what John said. Behold, the Lamb of God. Remember the Lamb of uh, Egypt. John announced it. Behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said after me, cometh a man that is preferred before me. Like he said in verse 28. For he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. That is, that I might introduce him to Israel. That's why I came before him, and I'm now baptizing people to introduce them to him. Because he is the person to look unto, not unto himself. And when John was introducing himself at another place, he said... I must decrease and he will increase. Brethren, do you know something? With every respect, but I see something that we need to endeavor to kill more especially we from Africa. Other people and other parts of the world may have their problems. I have, few, I have seen few white believers. When they believe, they believe on the rudiments of what thing that we are taught that led them to salvation. They believe on it. They hold on to it. But there is one sickness I see among black people. And it is painful. You know the sickness? We are talking and laying the foundation 
of our Christian faith. What if you believe you are sure to go to heaven? But many people are not interested in that. What they are listening and waiting to hear is miracle. And the Bible showed us perfect example that true candidates of heaven always follow. You know one of the examples? John the Baptist, Jesus testified of him and said, of all men born of women, none is greater than John the Baptist. But do you know what? In all the days of John the Baptist, until he died, he never performed one miracle. He never healed the sick. John the Baptist never cast out devils. He was saying, repent! The kingdom of God is at hand. Do you know that? If you don't repent, you may be in church. You may go to church. You were born in church. If you don't repent, you will still go to hell. That is the truth. So he said, the first message John the Baptist preached, the first message that Jesus Christ preached was, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. And then he said, the tree, the, the axe is laid at the feet of the, the foot of the tree. Any tree that bringeth no forth good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And he said, therefore, bring forth fruit, meat, good, qualified for repentance. And most people don't think of these things. How to bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. And how do we know these people? I call them in my own language, weaver bird Christians. Weaver bird Christians. You know the weaver bird? If you came from Africa, if you came from the Niger, weaver birds are those birds that are red on their neck and head and black on their body. There's the weaver bird. And if you cross the river Niger, and you are going up north. They have another type that look yellowish or orange. Uh, sorry, lemon. Lemon color. You, when they move, they come in hordes and come to a tree. Until all the leaves of that tree is finished, they don't leave. They will take all the leaves and build their nest until everything there is gone. They will move again. These are the weaver beds. I ask you. Is your Christianity the Christianity of weaver bird? How do you know them? When they hear tomorrow that a man is coming, they will not wait to ask, who is this man? Where did he come from? With what spirit is he preaching? With what spirit is he performing his miracle? They will not ask. They will all rush and go. And the Bible told us by Jesus himself in the book of Matthew chapter 24, he said, Many pro false prophets, many foul spirits have entered into the world. And their messengers are even changing themselves to become messengers of light. Only those that have understanding will be able to know them. So, let our Christianity not be the Christianity of the weaver birds. Let our Christianity not be the Christianity of Whatever you see, you throw into your mouth. You don't ask, what is the source? Who is this man? What is the testimony of this man? That's what has killed many people. That's why you see somebody, he will be in church. Ten years, five years, he will not learn anything because his ears are open. Anytime he hears this happening in Bologna, whether they say the man came out from the water, seven years, he has been in this the river and came out. They will go there. They will tell what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is miracle. Let me just get miracle. And then they get miracle at the exchange of their soul. Brethren, it pains me that when many of us supposed to be teachers, when many of us supposed to be gurus, teaching people, and practicing through Christianity because they know it, 
they teach it when they should be teachers. They need again that somebody teach them the first principles of the oracle of God. And you know what happens? Anywhere they sit and the people argue and said it is that rapture had taken place, they say maybe it is true. No, another group say there's nothing like rapture at all. All these people are deceiving you. Say so maybe it's true. They never believe anything. Ever learning. The Bible says they are ever learning. They will never come to the knowledge of the truth. But you know what? Beginning with me, I will receive judgment. If I am exposed to this truth and I don't understand it, you know why it will be judgment unto me? Men and brethren, we know the time corn is abundant in the market. We know the time oil is abundant in the market. We know the time particular items are flooded in the market. In Italy, we know the time of sconto. And during the time of sconto, people come back from work, they don't rest. They begin to go from shop to shop. They begin to go from shop to shop because they know that this season is a season of sconto. They know it. And the Lord said, you know the times and seasons. You know when the weather changes, that it will bring rain tomorrow. But you fail to understand the signs of the times that you are living in. If there be any church that should be serving God, confidently, anywhere you meet them, you will see them exuding faith, joy of the Lord. They should be watchmen, but unfortunately, not many of them are true watchmen. But you can decide to be a true watchman. How long will you live in error? How long will you live in error? And the truth of God's word is made available, is being made available unto you, and you trash it. Where are they? Those of them that made light the word of God. Where are they today? Let me show you something in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrew, chapter. Hebrews chapter 4 or chapter 3 before we go to 4. We are for holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. Consider him. Who was faithful to him that appointed him? That is, was, Jesus was faithful unto God. As also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who had built the house had more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those, of those things which are to be spoken. But Christ as a son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast, the confidence and the rejoicing of the faith of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved, I was offended with that generation. And I said, that they always err are in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, in my anger, they shall never enter into my rest. God said he swear in his wrath, in his anger, that such unbelieving people will never have peace, will never have his rest. Look at verse 12. Take heed, brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Lest, he said, take heed. That means as I'm reading this out and you are reading with me in your Bible. 
that Paul, writing to the Hebrew Christian, he said, take heed. And I'm talking to watchmen. <laughs> take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. That is, young men, you may sit among callous, thoughtless young men like yourself. Uh, men, men of your age. I'm not saying you are like them. But then, how can unbelief set in? You say something about God. You read something about God. You wanted to meditate on it or you have started meditating on it and even confessing how by meditating on those words your life has been touched. What you used to like that offend God, you're not liking them again. And then you began to talk and you began to manifest and began to show some things and do some things. And you refused to hold tight to what you know is truth. And even getting up and walking away from their midst. Because you are bearing a precious vessel. You didn't. You sat down there. And at a point, they so spoke and so messed themselves around with you that you were carried away with their dissimulation. You were affected by their negative attitude. Listen to me. There are people that love to serve God. But you know what will kill them? They love to keep partnership with unbelievers. But you know what? These unbelievers, they never want to keep partnership with believers. You know, sometimes we talk to some people. You say, how do you want me to separate from my people? How if I separate from them? How will I save them? My, my brother, you are now Holy Ghost. And you have been with them five years, six years. Since you came to Italy, you ate together, you slept together, you had your house meeting together. You've not been able to affect them. But they have affected you. If you are sincere, if you say you are born again, if you say you are a Christian, you will know how they have affected you. There were things you were convinced. I'm not going to do this thing. But you saw that they were doing it and they were preaching it to you until... You looked around. Nobody was there to condemn you, to tell you, ah, bro, are you doing it? You looked around, you rubbed your head, rubbed your buttocks, and went and did it. Why? Evil communications corrupt good manners. All those people that argue and say, eh, you tell us to separate. God said it. It's not me that said it. From the Old Testament in the book of Proverbs, he said, my son, if sinners entice you, consent thou not. If they say, let us put our paws together. Let's have one common business. He said, don't agree with them. From the Old Testament, God forbid unequal yoke. Unequal yoke. There are people in church, women, their best friends are sinners. That's where they go and sit and tell all the stories of what is happening in Italy. And what is happening in their village. And can such people ever be clean? They can be clean. Can they ever be sanctified? They can never be sanctified. Can they ever grow in faith? Oh, impossible. You can't be drinking poison. And yet you want to live. Doesn't happen. There must be separation. Light and darkness have no fellowship. If you are light. You go to the light. And darkness will remain on its own. But if you go to darkness and submit yourself to darkness, your light will dim. And many people's light have dimmed. And what am I saying? Their light have been extinguished. So, in Hebrew chapter 12, he said, take heed. Brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Is it not unbelief that made people that they don't fear that Sunday, appointed time of thousands and thousands of watchmen, their time is 9 a.m. 9 a.m. And in many churches, like we are starting Sunday again, in many churches of the watchman, 8 o'clock. 
serious Christians have gathered and they pray and sweat and ask for divine visitation before the service takes off by nine. One hour they have prayed. Thank God for the churches where it is happening. Thank God for the people that bond themselves together whether pastor or no pastor, leader or no leader, worker or no worker. These brethren come together eight o'clock, begin their prayer, pray until nine and then fellowship takes off. Let me tell you, go and look at those people. Their lives have something to say. But I exhort you, one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. If you yield yourself to sin, if you yield yourself to unbelievers, if you associate with them, sin is very deceitful. Little by little, it, it creeps in. It creeps in. You will know it is coming. Lost will be creeping, you know, creeping in. Stealing itself into your mind. You will not know it. Until a little thing will happen. And you fall flat. And you fall flat. And when you wake up, you say, is it me? Yes, it, it, was, it is you. Yes, it is you. When the thing was creeping in, like, like an earthworm, you didn't take note. Because sin is very deceitful. In the first place, it can come to some people and say, my friend, you are of age. You can be anywhere. Because Christianity is not bondage. You should be able to mix up very well. And you are mixing up and they are sapping the grace that it took you time to fast, to not keep night vigil until you acquire the grace. And you want to show that you have arrived. And in chapter 4, he said, there is a rest that is promised. But people couldn't enter that rest because of unbelief. Chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing before it remained that some must enter into that rest. And they to whom it was first presented or preached entered not because of unbelief. They didn't enter into that rest that God prepared for them because of their unbelief. So, we are seeing today that redemption through Christ is efficacious and the efficacy of it is by the blood. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians 1, 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Are you reading with me? In whom we have redemption. That is in Christ. Whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins inclusive. According to the riches of his grace. In Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. I read from verse 13 to 14. Who had delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption. Through his blood, we were redeemed through the blood of Jesus. In whom we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins. All these we get through the blood of Jesus Christ. Through the redemptive power that is in the shed blood of Calvary. This redemption is efficacious. It's complete. It's okay. It serves what God wants. That is, it is able to produce the result that it is intended to produce. Praise the Lord. Look up. I tell you something. August 16, 1980. I was living with some young men in a block of uh, flats. I have my own apartment. And this invitation came to me. Before this invitation came, there is a lifestyle that many of those boys had. I wasn't born again. There are things I decided long ago before the tabernacle, before the altar, 
in one big church at Abba. I went there and swore that I wasn't going to mess myself around. But that was not what makes somebody righteous. I took that decision. The sin of immorality is not the only sin. There are other sins that we send people to hell. But because of what is happening in the mind of people, most people attack it as if it is the only sin. So as a young boy, I decided and went to the church and knelt before the altar with Bible in hand. It is not the right thing, but I did it out of ignorance and my zeal in order to be free because I saw what other people were doing. They were living a type of life that offended me. So I took an oath that I will not mess myself up, but I could lie. I could be envious. I could be proud. I could be arrogant. I could cheat. And many other things were there. But August 16, 1980, I left this my young men. Many of them. We are all young men. We are just free. Beginning life afresh. You know, we are not under our, our masters anymore. So many of them, they, they want to enjoy liberty to the high heavens. So I left. I went to that crusade. At that crusade, I had the word of God. And when the preacher was preaching, he said, who wants to give his life to Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It was like he was physically present. When this man says it again, my body jolts. And I came out in the arena and they told us to confess our sins and forsake them and ask Jesus to come into our life and to wash us from our sins. We prayed. After the prayer, I felt so happy. I felt so happy. In fact, the joy was so much that I drove from Tafawa Belewa Square to our place of residence in Surulere. And I went to those boys and I was knocking at their door. I said, I'm born again. I am born again. If I went into my house, carried my television and all the boogie boogie music, the midnight energy, Sonia Spence and so many of them carried them out and smashing them that night. Nobody preached anything to me because I knew what was happening in me when those things were playing around my life. And so I spoiled all these things. My, my friends came out. They were shocked, looking at me as if any knot has gone out of my head. But I experienced salvation. Joy of the Lord was there. Joy of sin forgiven was there. That was the beginning of this, my journey. But if your beginning was it's a beginning that you're not sure how it began, how you renounced sin, and how you got the forgiveness of sin and joy that sins are forgiving you, then something is amiss somewhere. When you are born again, there will be an evidence in your heart. No wonder in the book of Psalm 51, when David sinned, and Nathan came and told him that God had discovered what you did. You killed Uriah because you slept with his wife. And, Moses, and David cried and said, Have mercy upon me, O God, in your loving kindness. In your compassion, blot out my offenses. I've sinned against you and against heaven. I've done what is evil in your sight. Because I was shapen in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. He went on and prayed and prayed and said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. There is a joy of salvation. When you are born again, you receive it. When you receive that joy, nobody can take it away from you. It is about the joy of corn and wine and promotion and the engagement. Joy of salvation. You can get it through the blood of Jesus Christ. When you surrender your life to Christ, repenting of your sins, your sins will be forgiven you. Praise the Lord. So, the blood of atonement that was used in the Old Testament did not produce this intended result, this intended joy, this intended freedom. Oh my God, when you are forgiven, when you repent in dust and ashes, when you have been born again, when you are forgiven, the joy knows no limit. The joy, you can't quantify it. It's so great. 
you will feel as if you have never committed sin before. Although you may have committed abortion, although you may have stolen, but the moment your sins are forgiven, no wonder the Bible said in the, third, the, the, the three weeks ago, we saw Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2. Can we read? Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputed not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile, there is no deceit. Say, happy is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sins have been covered, possibly wiped away. Happy is the man unto whom the Lord had imputed no iniquity. That is, God has not put any guilt on that person. And that is salvation. And that can only come with the blood of Jesus. Because in the Old Testament, the blood of animals could not wash away sin. Let's read in Hebrew chapter 9. Hebrew 9. In Hebrews chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats. Okay, let's start from verse 11. He said, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, not of this material body. Neither, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That is confirming the message again, the efficacious redemption that can only come through Christ. In fact, in the book of Isaiah chapter 11, sorry, chapter 53, verse 11, God said that when I saw the travail of the heart of Jesus, I became satisfied that by his blood, all the sins of mankind will be washed away. Because he traveled, he sorrowed, he cried, he was compassionate for the sinners. And so God saw him as a qualified lamb, animal sacrifice for the sinful world. Because the priest of old, they came with the blood of goats and of sheep and of calves and of oxen, which were not their own blood. So they just sacrificed it and sprinkled the blood. But Jesus Christ gave himself. And for you to know what the, the Lord means, he said, in the book of Matthew, that Jesus came and saw some lepers. And the leper came and said, Lord, if you will, you can make us clean. He said, and the Bible said, he was moved with compassion. And he said, I will be thou clean. That is the kind of mind of the Savior we are talking about. That there is willingness in him to die. There is willingness in him to sacrifice that you might live. It is not like the priests who used animal sacrifice that is not their own blood, but he used his own blood. In Hebrew 9, verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the arches of heifer sprinkling the unclean and sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh. Remember, I told you, it is ceremonial cleansing. Sanctifying the flesh, not the soul. The cleansing does not penetrate the heart, does not reach the conscience, but it is to make them ceremonially 
outwardly clean. That was what the blood sacrifice of old availed. But in verse 14, he says, how much more? He says, if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of heifer that was sprinkling the unclean, sanctify the unclean person to the purifying of his flesh. He says then, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, if the blood of animals made physically the body clean, he said, how much more with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot unto God, how much more will he purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? My brethren, this is where I am proud of the death of Jesus Christ. That the blood of animals could not make a man's conscience to be free. But applying the blood of Jesus, the habit of sin that had held you, that had taken you captive, that by the blood of Jesus, you can be set free. That no matter the habit you said you are into, that when the blood of Jesus Christ comes upon your soul, comes upon your spirit, by faith, that yoke must be broken. Hallelujah. So, in verse 15, in verse 15, he says, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. Ah, ah, let me talk a little to my brothers and sisters who are Catholics. Because the person talking to you, I am, I am Catholic in my marrows. Because if I want to talk about Catholicism, you will know that you don't know anything about it. I followed it and I searched into it because I was fighting people before. Before, if you preach the gospel to me, I fight you. When I was that type of Catholic that when I read the book of uh, Proverbs, and the book of Proverbs were referred to wisdom with a feminine at, uh, article saying uh, wisdom um, um, uh, love her for she is a crown unto your head. I was so fanatical in my Catholic defense. Uloma, are you listening to me? Okay. I was so fanatical that in those days if I read the book of uh, Proverbs, where it talks about wisdom and refers to her as to it as with a feminine gender, I will say that. What are you talking about? You, you don't see that the Bible is talking about Virgin Mary. I will be doing that. But God was talking about wisdom. Unqualified wisdom using the feminine gender to describe it. I took it as Virgin Mary. Just because I must defend her at all costs. Now, when you look at this, the Bible said that's, that by this blood of Christ, by which we are saved, that that's why Christ is the mediator, the only mediator. But unfortunately, my fellow Catholics, we were taught, and I believed it in those days until I read the scripture. It says that there is only one mediator, that we are not two. There are not two. Many of us that are ignorant because we didn't read the Bible, we were told that there is the mediator, there is the mediatrix. That Mary is the mediatrix. But look at what the scripture said. In the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verse 12, write it and go and read. He said, there is no other name under the sun, whether in heaven or on earth, whereby you can be saved except the name of Jesus. And look at where we are reading in the book of Hebrew chapter 9. He said, in Hebrew chapter 9, verse 15. And for this cause, he, Christ, is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of his death, for the redemption of the transgression, that we are under the first testament, my God. That is to say, all the sins that Abraham committed. Noah, Isaac, Jacob, 
David, all those people that served God of old, all the sins they committed, and they offered sacrifice of animals. Those animal sacrifices covered their sins away from the eyes of God, waiting until this last sacrifice and only sacrifice of Christ will be made. Let's read it again. Brethren, if you don't remember anything, remember this scripture. He said, for this reason, he, Jesus Christ, is the mediator of the New Testament that by means, that is, what his death carries along or brought for the redemption of the transgressions that were, that means, all the things that percolated sins of our patriarchs. He says the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. And remember, the first testament was not found worthy. So it was abrogated and the new testament in the blood of Jesus Christ was instituted because the old one was not worthy and was faulty and it was taken away. A new one came. And he said, all the sins of the old and sacrifices of the old, we are none of them atoned for. Rather, that they were kept until this last one of Christ will be made. So he said that we are under the first testament. That they, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Now, this is showing you the place of this efficacious redemption. The efficacy in the blood of redemption is not limited to the New Testament believer. The sin offering or propitiation is for the whole world, including Old Testament believers. That means that the blood of the New Testament that Christ shed spread and went back to cover the sins of the people that lived in time past. Oh, can you remember that it was when Jesus died and his blood dropped from his hand and touched the ground and he said, it is finished. Into thy hand I commend my spirit that his spirit left according to Ephesians chapter 4, he first went into the lower part and took captivity captive and released Abraham and released Isaac because until that time, they were in the place they call limbo or lower paradise. They couldn't go to heaven because after the sin of Adam, the gate of heaven was closed and it was the sacrifice of Christ that opened the gate of heaven. And when it was opened, these men that were put in chains under the lower paradise because they died as God's friends. Now, that place was open and they came out and people testified according to the word of God in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 26 from verse 50 that they saw them before eventually they went to heaven. Meaning, before Christ, none of those Old Testament saints went to heaven. So, that the blood sacrifice of Christ was so efficacious that it covers both the New Testament and the Old Testament. It was the blood of the Old Testament through believers, sorry, it was the blood that Old Testament through believers looked forward to. Looked forward to it. That is, they were hoping for it by faith and we are also saved by it. If you read the book of Deuteronomy 18, 15, he said, a prophet of your people with the Lord your God sent. And that prophet was Jesus. If you read uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 25, he talks about Jesus. If you read John chapter 1, verse 45, he talked about Jesus. And if you read John chapter 3, verse 16, he talks that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever that believeth in him will have everlasting life. He that believeth not is already condemned. St. Matthew tells us that 
These saints rose up from their graves when Christ died. And we are seen by many in Jerusalem in Matthew 27, 50 to 53. Now, that the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed, what else can hinder you from being saved? What there is can hinder your sins, both past and present, from being forgiven and from being washed. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 22. And almost all things are by the law poured with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. The blood of Jesus is so powerful. Look at Revelation chapter 12. This is for you to do battles. This is for you to fight spiritual warfare. In your family, in your house, where you live, you're packed into a new house. And then in the night you dream bad dreams. Some things are walking around in the house. This is the weapon you should use. You entered into a new office and you are afraid of what your predecessor did before you came in there to have a weapon. The efficacious power in the blood of Jesus. So he said in Revelation chapter 12, I read from verse 11, and they overcame him. That is the devil. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. So, the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed. What else can hinder your sins, whether past or present, from being forgiven? Anybody that believes and trusts in Jesus today will be saved from sin and his soul sanctified by the blood of the new covenant. So, the blood of Jesus, the death of Jesus is efficacious enough. This is efficacious redemption. The redemption that saves and saves completely. Rise up and let's pray. Take advantage of it. Don't be a follow, follow Christian. Take advantage of what happened at Calvary. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool do your sins be as scarlet do your sins be as scarlet they shall be as white as snow they shall be as white as snow we forgive your transgression and remembers them no more. He will forgive your transgressions and remembers them no more. Look unto me, ye people, says the Lord your God. He forgives your transgressions. He forgives your transgressions and remembers them no more. And remember them no more. I want you to pray and commit yourself to Christ. That from today you vow a vow that backward never. I will never back away from Jesus. His salvation and redemption is efficacious. It's complete. Whatever I'm looking for to come to God, to qualify to go to heaven, Jesus has it. He accomplished them all. You can confess your sins. You can repent. You can be born again tonight. You can rededicate yourself and you can consecrate yourself.
This is the fellowship of true believers. This is fellowship of believers. We are true Christians have they are feeding. We are the feed in the word of God. Pray, pray unto God. Get what you ought to get after such a teaching. Thursday is the fellowship of elders. Elders of the church. They are the people that come on Thursday. They know what they share that day. Pray. Bring your heart before the Lord. Let the Lord cleanse your heart. My Father, in the name of Jesus, can I ever look unto anything or person for salvation, if not the Lord? Can anything be efficacious enough to wash away my sins if not the blood of Jesus? So Lord, I come by faith and I pray that because of the efficacious power in the blood and in the redemption, Lord, my salvation, my sanctification, my baptism in the Holy Ghost will be so complete that nothing will be lacking because Jesus provided everything. Jesus gave everything. Jesus' death and resurrection qualifies me for full salvation, full sanctification, full redemption. Eternal Father, I bless your name because of the accomplished work of Calvary. I bless your name because this is the only sacrifice that pleases you and pleased you that when you look at it, you will wash away our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, brethren, before we conclude, let it be clear to you that there is no other place and no other sacrifice under heaven by any creature that can wash away your sins except the redemption and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that means, are you into a habit and you are struggling with it? The power in this redemption and the power in the blood is able to set you free. You are looking for a conscience void of offense towards God and towards man. The blood of Jesus will sanctify you. Are you wanting to be free from sin and be completely submissive unto God? The blood of Jesus Christ will make you ready for that. Now, as you pray, you pray with this assurance. I'm telling you, you can never be the same again. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing is the word of God. And you have heard that word, and you must be set free. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful unto you that there is a perfect redemption package. Hey! People go to hospital, and they administer vaccines on them. They administer some analgesics on them. In fact, people that are suffering from one terrible ailment of all or other, all the vaccines that they were able to get, they said it cannot cure them 100%. But Lord, we are talking about a vaccine that can cure all sin sicknesses. And that's the blood of Jesus. Oh Lord, what a great gift you have given to us. This night, as the people go home and pray that the efficacious power in this redemption package will begin operation in their lives. My father, by Sunday, there will be testimonies. 
Thank you, Father, for answer to prayer. Lord, explain these teachings more than we have explained it. As men sleep, let divine teacher teach them the rest. Because the Bible said, the anointing that we received, the anointing teaches. Now, as your children go, let anointing teach them the rest. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for answered prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.